We're not happy yet. Everyone wait, we're getting happier. Are we happy now? That's good. Good morning, everyone. Joel called you a beautiful church. I'm telling you, it's true. I'm looking at you. This is a place that pleases God. This is a place full of people who God is in the process of healing and sanctifying, loving, cherishing, speaking highly of. What a good place. Thank you, Dylan. Dylan, where'd you go? Dylan's here. Dylan is not, pro, is it, can I say you're not thrilled to be on stage? Is that fair to say? It's just, it's just, we call him Big Daddy D when behind the scenes, but uh, Dylan, thanks for doing that. We appreciate that. Um, I want to give you guys a warning, I'm, and this is, in the English speak, this is called the dangling participle. It's on purpose, and I know it. You want to be here next week really bad. That's all I'm giving you. <laughs> we have a whole bunch of new people here today. I've met some of you. We're excited to have you. Um, I, if, if I haven't met you, I'd like to meet you after the service. My name is Peter. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, we don't want to embarrass you. We won't make you stand or anything like that. We just want you to know that you're welcome here and we're glad to have you. Earlier this week, uh, I drove down uh, Louvain, and uh, corner of Fourth and Louvain, there is a Tim Hortons and a gas station, a strip mall, the weirdest um, hardware store I've ever been in. <laughs> yeah, those of you that don't aren't laughing, you don't know, but it's worth the trip. You should go. Sometimes they sell hardware, but uh, also pie and chili, and goldfish, and anything else they can think of. It's interesting. That area used to be called 4400th, 4th Ave North, and it was the Bible college that I went to. And uh, that Bible college, uh, the denomination voted, and, and it was moved along with my family out to Calgary. It's still out there. It says hello. It hopes you're doing well. But that building housed my family in, in, in a certain kind of way since the late 80s. That was our move from Ontario to uh, Regina. My father was a professor at the seminary there. It was the first job I ever had. Uh, I, well, no, my first job was a paper route, but this was the, the first job I ever had that wasn't a paper route. I swept floors and, and uh, washed dishes. Uh, I worked for Dan Kalman. Dan Kalman was uh, chiefly responsible for keeping that place, uh, the building, up and running, and all of the plumbing and all of the wiring and all of the everything, and he did it for zero dollars. Uh, you know, that's often how Bible schools go. That school's been there for a long, long time. And uh, when we moved out, that school became a different school. As a matter of fact, there's a few people in here who attended that school. Then later it became the Bobby Orr Center, and, and, uh, and now it is in the process of being demolished. In fact, I'm, I haven't been there real recently. I'm sure it's gone at this point. And I'm one of those people, I'm not hugely sentimental. Um, I, I rather look at this with some excitement. And I wonder what God has in store for that significant chunk of land. It's, it's a big one. And I want to be sensitive to those who are missing uh, what was there. And, and uh, for some of you, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. That's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't need to, to touch you. It, it touches me. I'm excited to see what God has in store there. Man, that's a lot of space. I mean, he could have something exciting planned. And so I, I look forward to that with anticipation. But as I sat there in my truck and I watched as a bobcat moved some rubble around separating the, uh, this from that, my mind went to the weeks before we left Regina to move to Alberta. And I was part of a whole group of people that uh, would bring stuff out of the building and uh, would put it in a garage sale. And this was the the best garage sale you've ever been to. You could buy everything from you know, old pencils and papers all the way up to vans and trucks and everything in between. There were benches and tables. There were endless TVs and 
VCRs, it was in those days. There was kitchen stuff. There was dorm stuff. There's just everything that is necessary for a school where people literally live to operate. Some of that went to Alberta, not much. And the rest of it went into this garage sale. And we sold, and we sold, and we sold until we got to the end of the garage sale. And then we started giving away. And we gave and we gave. And anyone coming, if you wanted one thing, we snuck another thing into your car. Because you needed that thing. And then at the very end of it, my job was to load the trucks. To take the stuff that we could not sell, that we could not give away, that Value Village would not take, and haul it to the dump, and pay someone else to just take our stuff. There are those of you in here right now who are saying, are you sure? Why didn't you try donating it somewhere? And I, I, here's my promise to you. It's still exactly where we left it at the dump. By all means, you can go get it. And you can donate it wherever you want. But some of what came out of there was really dusty, wrecked, old, no longer good. I mean, it used to be good. It was worth money. We bought it. We purchased it for a reason. We used it. And then we stored it. We like to store stuff. Churches are great at storing stuff. We particularly like Tupperware without lids. That's our favorite. If it is spaghetti orange, that's even better. We love pens that don't write. Ooh, we love those. The, the uh, staff here tease me because I'm pretty good at getting rid of stuff. And I'll come out of my office and say, oh no, he's getting rid of stuff. And sometimes I get rid of stuff and I get a phone call saying, hey, we found all this at Value Village. Do you want us to buy it for the church? No, <laughs> we don't. Just, I'm going to give you a heads up on this. If it is in DVD format, we don't want it. I love you. You're wonderful. We don't want it. It's, uh, the, the world has, has moved on from that, and it's been updated. But we sure spent a lot of money on it, didn't we? We bought that stuff. We needed that stuff. We stored that stuff. Sometimes we stored that stuff so long that we didn't have a place for people because we did store stuff. And then we moved the stuff, and that's kind of hard on us, isn't it? Now, I'm going to ask for a, this is a moment of honesty, okay? Prepare yourselves. And I want you to vote. How many of you own five cell phones you no longer use? Raise your hand nice and high, fingers to the sky, come on. Okay, six phones you don't any longer use. Seven? Let's talk about iPads, shall we? Laptops? How many of you still own a printer, and it would be good except the ink dried out, but you cannot bring yourself to throw it out, but you're sure never going to buy ink for it? Come on, right to the top. It's tough getting rid of stuff, yes? Yes? Once we were done with the hoard at Canadian Bible College, then I went home to my house. I found another hoard. My wife and I, uh, we measure when we get rid of stuff, we measure it by laundry bins. And we say, we now have this many laundry bins full of space that we didn't used to have. And it's like, it's like having nothing is a possession that... We, have to, we want that, but in order to get that, we have to get rid of the thing that was in that nothing space. And so we had to get rid of our own personal hoard. There was a pile of it. We had to get rid of it. And my hobbies are really big things. Sometimes getting rid of really big things, and they're heavy. They're usually made of metal, and you have to find a place that will take the metal. And someone will say, haven't you tried to donate it? I tried. They said no. But it's really good. Haven't you called around? I've called around. Well, why don't you try doing this? And I say to them, I tell you what I'll do. I will bring this to your house. And people say, no, you can't. I have my own hoard. Elastic bands that don't elastic anymore. It's okay, I'll quit talking about you here. 
I, I can sense it's uncomfortable. How many of you still have your high school yearbooks and you haven't opened them in 30 years? Yeah, I've heard yes, people, I, that's, yeah, just, go ahead, keep them. We moved our hoard. Well, we moved some of it, but we got rid of a pile of it. It was a lot of work. It wasn't terribly long ago, my wife called me and she said the school that she works, Aston Bible College, was considering a move to Regina. And should it happen, she, and therefore me, will be responsible to move <clears throat> the library. Now, we're talking about books. Some of you are already on the edge of your seat. I can see it. You mustn't get rid of books. So here's what we did. We did a garage sale, a huge one. We, the, the library would have occupied the vast majority of this room. It had been there since they invented reading. <laughs> there were books on there that were so precious that living fingers have not touched them in 50 years. That's how precious they are. But you can't get rid of them. The one that blew my mind, and this was in a small town, like a very small town, and they had um, Christian romance novels. But they were so conservative, here's what the novel was. There was a boy. They saw a girl. The boy thought the girl was pretty. The girl thought the boy was pretty. They both went home, prayed, never talked to each other ever again, book over. <laughs> There's a whole, f like... And you're looking at this going, why is this here? This doesn't make any sense. And so it's time to go. And so we start taking this down and we sold every book we could sell. And then we gave away every book that we can give away. So I would load my truck and I would drive all the way. First I drove to Kindersley and I gave those books to the Salvation Army until they quit taking them. Then I drove to Rosetown, gave books there till they quit taking them, drove to Saskatoon, gave away books there until they quit taking them, and then I drove to Regina. Now that one's personal. And I gave away every book I could until they would not take them any longer. And then a big blue recycling bin showed up. A big one. We had to move. I watched as 65 volumes of Spurgeon's sermons were tipped into the recycling bin. Oh, I can hear the indignation. Does it matter that every word of them is available for free with the click of a mouse? No! These are books! You mustn't get rid of them! Don't worry, here's my plan. I will bring them to your house. I will place them upon your front lawn. I will say, you're welcome. And I will drive away. There was a lot in that school that had to disappear. When, <laughs> this one made me laugh. There were students that went through school and didn't pay their bill. And so the school said, when you pay your bill, you can get your stuff out of your dorm. They just didn't pay their bill. It's been decades, like actual decades. Like, dec that's 10 years, but like several times over. They ain't going to pay the bill. They no longer care about the binder that has a Care Bear on it. Like, they don't care. <laughs> and it goes in the garbage. Guitars. Stephen, I'm sorry to tell you that. All kinds of stuff. Overhead projectors. Do you know how much money we spend on those overhead projectors? Yes, but since then we invented whatever that is. Where is it? I can't, the lights are on, but you'll find it. It's on the roof here somewhere. All this stuff. And then we went home and I found another hoard. It was my hoard. And we bought a smaller house in Regina than we had in Kindersley because our kids are bigger, so that makes sense. <laughs> and we started to get rid of our hoard and I gave it away and I sold it and I... I went and hid it in people's garages and said, there you go, I think you need it. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth 
where moths and vermin destroy. If this was written in Saskatchewan, we would say, so does minus 40, so does humidity, so does dry climate, so does fire, so does zoning destroys. And where thieves break in and steal. This is an interesting one because we can say, okay, I'm not going to collect all the stuff. Instead, I'm going to collect the money that goes in the bank account. It's not going to rest because it's just digital. I want you to remember Venezuela within the last 10 years where the government came apart and the economy tanked so quickly that when people stood up to run for the border, this is literal, they stood up, they had money, and by the time they got to the border, their money was worthless. But like actually, that happened. How many times have we heard this story about Rome? War breaks out. I was talking with my... Uh, kids about this and all the little islands off of Africa went from we have money to literally the money is blowing in the streets because it has no value we think it can't happen don't worry we'll take all our money and turn it into cryptocurrency that worked till it didn't in fact, that one of my, uh, I had a board chair whose son's with us today, and he said, my next computer is coming from the money I've invested in cryptocurrency. And as it makes, I would say, interest, he would use that money to buy a computer. And it worked until it didn't. This happens to us, doesn't it? We have this idea it doesn't happen to us. That's because we stand on a mound of privilege that says we are protected Don't worry, I downloaded an app on my phone. It means I'm protected. Even though, historically, it proves that not to be true. But, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. This is talking about where your focus is. I've heard this scripture used to talk about ultimately sexual purity. And yes, there is an element of that, but you must understand that when they were reading this, the internet didn't exist. I mean, when they're writing this, the internet didn't exist. And so they were not talking about our reality. Yes, it applies, but no, that wasn't what they were talking about. They were talking about money versus not money. Stuff versus no stuff. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And then the light within you is darkness. And how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both money and God. And the very place that educated me is crumbling, literally. And my house is full of stuff. I moved two boxes that are still in my basement that I don't want to open because I don't want to deal with them. And one of them is full of really expensive junk. And the other one is full of somewhat less expensive junk. And I paid money to move it here. And there's a bobcat separating the rubble in a place that it seems like moths and vermin have destroyed. So I've told you that story and you've heard that sermon before. You've heard one where they say "Don't." it's not about your bank account. It's about treasures in heaven. And yes, it is. I've told you that so that I can tell you this. This is what the real sermon's about. Two weeks ago, I boarded an airplane and I flew to Grand Prairie, where the Edies hail from, right? Some of them. Grand Prairie is a, it's a small city in Alberta. 
It's uh, oil, uh, a lot of oil, lots of trucks. And uh, when I got off the airplane, <clears throat> I met up with the group of people that I would spend the majority of that week with. One of them is named Bill. Bill is the pastor at, uh, uh, not Heritage, Hillsdale Alliance Church. Nope. Hillsdale Baptist Church, beg your pardon, here in town. Spent most of the week with him. And the other one is named Nico. Nico is from uh, Celebration. I tease him. I say his church is called Celebration, not Lutheran. Used to be called Celebration Lutheran. He's never found that joke funny. I find it funny every time. So I keep telling it until he understands. <laughs> we were the Regina guys that were brought down. Different denominations on purpose. We met up with a woman named Whitney. Whitney is from Yellowknife. Whitney is a, uh, a, a priest from a united church. And that church focuses very directly on feeding hungry and housing the, the uh, homeless people. And her reality in Yellowknife is such that where she lives, there's bush in every direction. And they don't actually know who lives in the bush. They've lived there for who knows how long. And they're not on, they don't have electricity. They have generators. They don't have water from the, the city. They have wells or they have a lake or whatever it is. So they don't know who's out there. And so she's going around and trying to care for these people. There's also three uh, pastors from Niagara region in Ontario. One of them was trained with Nazarene uh, denomination and he's just started at an alliance church. There was another pastor who was from a non-denominational church. He and I got along well because uh, our, our humor matched up. And his non-denominational church joins up with a whole bunch of other non-denominational church. And I looked at him and I said, that's called a denomination. <laughs> the denomination is called the non-denominational. And he laughed and he said, that's how denominations work. And I said, I know that. I'm part of one. There was another guy, and he was part of an ACOP church. And they all came up to join together. We all came up in Grand Prairie, and we were going to attend, we would say, a Billy Graham organization event. It's run by Will Graham, who is Billy Graham's grandson. And he calls it a celebration, but it is much what you expect if you're aware of uh, what Billy Graham has historically done. And they brought us there so that we could see behind the curtains. We could see what is going on with the tech end of it. We met with Will Graham each day and, and he peppered us with questions and we asked him a few. He's deciding whether or not he wants to come here to Regina. I have no information on that, by the way. That's something where we don't invite them. They just tell us they're coming. And I'll, I'll let you know when, when they tell us, if they tell us. He is also looking at Yellowknife and he's also looking at the Niagara region uh, in Ontario. And so we were able to interact back and forth. But mostly, I spent all day, every waking hour, with these pastors. From very different backgrounds, very different denominations, very different philosophies. In fact, very different philosophies. And different theologies. And we would talk about why do we do church in this way. And each person would pipe up and say, well, we do it this way. And there was always someone that thought and often said, well, you shouldn't do it that way. You should do it this way. And we would talk about the philosophy of that until we would get to the theology behind why we did it. And the, I was the only one there that was actually right. I know, I asked Joel, and he told me I was right. I went over to Joanna, and she said, yeah, you're right. So that's how I know. They were all wrong. We had fascinating conversations. We had conversations that were, um, they would get to a certain place, and I couldn't go there with them. And I would get to a certain place, and they wouldn't come here with me. They had firm convictions about that, and I have firm con uh, convictions about this. And there we were. We were. It was friendly. It, this is sounding like it was tense. It really wasn't. It was fun. It was funny. 
We got to tease each other about stuff. What are you picking for supper? Don't worry about it. It's already been predestined. What are you picking for, some, for supper? Nobody knows. All that kind of stuff. It was fun. We had a good time. Whitney sat there. She's the only person from a mainline church. She looked at all the evangelical guys like we were crazy. We had us a good time. And we walked around. And we saw what it takes to put on one of these celebrations. I was standing in the back of uh, a room, and uh, a woman came, comes in. She's dressed very nicely, very nicely. Turns out she's the mayor of Grand Prairie, and it's an election year. And so they, the Billy Graham uh, Association surrounds her and say, we want you to go on stage and say we're happy and welcome and all those things, but you may not run for politics here. That's not what this is, so don't do it. We'll shut the mic off. Don't do it. They had two different MPs. They said, you're welcome to come up, but you're not running for office. You're not getting votes. If you're going to do that, we'll shut the mics off. We don't care. Okay, and so they went up and they did that. I stood with a whole band and I was talking. I didn't even know they were a band. I was standing with these guys, talking with them. Bunch of Irish guys, really neat. It was Ren Collective. I didn't know who they were. They walked away from me, walked up on stage, and started singing. That was my first clue that they were the band. (laughs) I'm recording stuff and sending it back to our staff saying, look at this, this is amazing. 4,000 people, 4,000 people filled that hockey arena with no ice, just chairs where the ice would be, chairs all the way around. They filled it three times. 4,000 people. Each time there is music, there is a message, a basic message. Then there is a call forward. There were 300 volunteers. Each of them had gone through training, intensive training. So that when the people came to the front to respond to this call, there was someone there not only to greet them, but also to say to them, I am going to connect you with a church. Those churches already knew what was happening, and they were ready. So by the time Tuesday morning came around, there were emails at the churches saying, these are the people, this is their information, they have responded to this call and you need to connect with them and you need to connect with them by this time and if we don't hear back from you by this time we're going to connect them with another church because we're in the business of doing this we're made for this so come on get on board so in truth I was quite impressed I, I looked at it the organization of it which there are some people when you say organization it leaves you cold But every time you go to the hospital, you're desperate for organization. You don't want to go to a church without organization. It's fun once. But then you go in there and you're hungry or you're hurt or you're sad or you want to serve or something and there is no organization. And so I was impressed with the organization. And so there we were. I stood beside... (laughs) They had the... uh, like uh, MVP seating, and they put me in it, which was very kind of them. But number one, (laughs) seats are really small. And I'm sitting beside someone who's roughly my size, and we're like this, and I'm like, oh, man. So I went and I stood against the wall. And another guy came and stood beside me, and he, he he was 60 years old, he told me. He has a great big long Santa Claus beard, and he was cut. He just lives in the gym. He is Mr. Beefcake. And he is, uh, he's telling me, he told me a few things repeatedly. One of them was that he had made enough money in his life that he doesn't have to work anymore, which that's an interesting way to start a conversation, but away we go. And I was like, I'm not there yet. (laughs) But that was the only difference between him and I that I could see. (laughs) And he introduced me to his wife and they talked. I said, so what brought you to Grand Prairie? And he said, the Holy Spirit did. And I said, cool, from where? And he said, California. And I said, everybody from California ends up in Grand Prairie. And he talked about people discipling him. And he came for the music. He's a Christian, but he came for the music. It was cool. I liked meeting him. 
And I talked with another guy. And that guy just comes to everything that happens in that stadium. In fact, they no longer charge him for things. They give him a chair. He's there for everything. So he's there for this. I walked around and they had security. This was the funniest thing because like, so the, the, the hockey stadium says how many people are coming. You tell them and they say you need this much security. So there is security for 4,000 people at a Billy Graham thing where little kids are literally walking around with popcorn. And so I went back to one of the security guys and said, is this your easiest job you've ever done? Oh, this is the easiest job I've ever done. We stand here and do nothing but listen. Interesting. And then the altar call comes. The paperwork on my desk currently says 370 people gave their lives to the Lord in that moment. I went to the front and I was praying with people. We have these little packages that we're supposed to give them. And in it is this card and you're supposed to fill out the information if they're willing to fill out the information so that we can connect you with a church somewhere so that you can go and you can become discipled. And I watched as all of the volunteers, those 300 volunteers, are each with someone, one-on-one. And they're able to talk with these people. And I watched in the corner as these people are praying and there were a lot of tears. Over in this corner was a whole pile of teenagers and they were excited and everybody knew it. They were jumping up and down and they were cheering and they were hugging their friends. And I just, I looked at it and I thought it's one of the most sincere things I've ever seen. And I watched as a man in a wheelchair wheeled his way forward until one of the volunteers said, do you need help? Yes, I need help. Pushed him up to the the front and his information was taken and all these people are giving their lives to the Lord and I'm watching the volunteers and I'm watching them they're not pastors almost none of them are pastors they're they're real estate agents they lots of them worked in the oil field like a huge number of them blue collared lots of them were saying I wish I wasn't on stage that's not my favorite place to be Lots of them were saying, I'm willing to help, but I just don't know how. And then the altar call comes, and what these people found out was they were made for this. God figured that one out long before anyone had ever heard of Billy Graham. When they were made... God said, I've made you for this. And the horde of people came to the front. That horde does not end up in the dump. That horde does not vanish. What, I'm, I'm a, uh, I can get um, suspicious about things. And I watch people come to the front and I think, ah, oh, did that, did that, are they coming up because everyone's coming up? Are they coming up because it's, that's cool, they want to be part of this, is it mob mentality? And then I remember that my mom became a Christian at a Billy Graham crusade. And Faith entered the Bethune family, that's my mom's maiden name. Through my mom. Eleven brothers and sisters, including my mom, they have all given their lives to the Lord. Some of them ever so conservative. Women over there, men over here, women wear hats. Women don't speak in church. Some of them so liberal that, oh, oof. I mean, they drink Coke and Pepsi. It's real. The seeds planted in my mom did not turn into flowers for years, but they did turn into flowers. They were made to do this. Listen, I want fish to swim. They're made for that. 
I want birds to fly. They're made for that. I want you not to have your focus on stuff and things and the generation of wealth and the generation of stuff that will rot and moths will eat. And when people come to the front, I want you there. I don't want you saying, I can't, I have to work. Instead, I want you responding to how God made you. You were designed for this as sure as fish swim. We stood there with our theological differences, with our, philo- our, our philosophical, dish- <laughs> philosophical differences. All of us saying, Jesus is Lord, and everything after that seemed to be transactional. And when that call came forward, all of us dropped our theological dangling participles and ran to the front and up at the front experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit in a way that if you've experienced it, you would want to never leave it. But the cost of that might be the encyclopedias that you have not touched. Might be letting people into your house and you don't like people in your house. It's your house. Might be being with someone who, they might say bad words. They might smoke things, all manner of things. They might view their life in a way that you don't view your life. They might think things about themselves that you disagree with fundamentally. You may cling to your philosophies if you want. If you'll excuse me, I'm running for the front. And I want you there. I'm going to call the worship team back to the front. Here is what I want from you. What do you do with a sermon like this? Here's my challenge. It's simple. I want you to come up to one of the leaders in the church and say, I want to participate in what God made me to be. I want to let go of that which will rust, corrode, moths will eat, vermin will destroy, governments will overthrow. I want to leave that. And instead, I want to rush for the front where God has called me. And I don't know what I'm going to do, but I want to do it. And I want to be trained to do it. And I want to be discipled into it because I'm made for this. That is what is available to you. And I call you to it. Come and talk to us. Pastor Peter left us with a challenge today. He wants you to participate in who God has made you to be, to give up the stuff that won't last, the stuff that will rust, the stuff that will lose value, and to do what you were made to do. Next week, we're going to see some people do exactly that. They're going to take a step into who God has made them to be. We're going to celebrate and watch some members of our congregation get baptized, saying, yes, I want what God has for me. We're going to get led in worship next week by our youth worship team. They said, I want what God has for me. I want to be who God has made me to be. And it comes with sacrifice. It comes with leaving behind those things that won't last. If you would like somebody to pray with you as you ask God to show you what he has for you, ask God to show you what are the things that you're holding on to that aren't going to last, please come to the front. Um, One of the leadership team or the prayer team would be more than happy to pray with you. Blessings on you as you go about your week. We're excited to see you back next week and to, um, to get to celebrate some of the amazing things that God has been doing in our community.